uh, awfully lucky that we're able to show these slides this morning. You've heard of Jerry Rig. <laughs> uh, this is Jerry Rig, but I think it might work. We'll see. Um, first of all, my second in the series on the Baroque, and this is a massive subject. I didn't quite finish last time on iconoclasm. The foundation of the Baroque is the Anna iconoclastic folks in the Catholic Church. So to go back again, just for those of you that were here last time, and remind everybody else, iconoclast, <coughs> iconoclast uh, is a, a breaker class, means to break um, images. <coughs> so an iconoclast be, was a very big theme uh, particularly in the Reformation. And so we're going to see how the Catholic Church reacted to oh. this iconoclastic movement and how it gloried in icons, art, all the arts, and how important that was to them. Now, uh, I want to I mention a couple of things. First of all, uh, we haven't really nailed this down yet. Just to date everything, the Reformation is in 1517. The Counter-Reformation, which is the, this is the birthplace of the Baroque, Counter-Reformation. They had, they had the Council of Trent, Now, the Council of Trent lasts uh, from about 1542 to 1562, approximately. In other words, <coughs> a meeting, you go to a meeting the last 20 years. Uh, people lived and died you know, during that time. And uh, so they basically decided, rather than concede much, if anything, to the Reformation, they would be, become even more Catholic, even more committed to the idea of art, and particularly in church. So churches were greatly decorated. They always had been, but this is even more so. Now, now at, at the same time this is going on, uh, you, you have a, a uh, group called the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits. Now the Jesuits were founded by a, a Spaniard by the name of Loyola. Perhaps you've heard of these Loyola universities in, around the United States. And, but the Jesuits are very big in preparatory school, and they have all kinds of Jesuit schools, including Dallas, which has a huge campus up there in North Dallas. So the Jesuits are very committed to the Catholic Church. In fact, it's the only order that takes a special bow, a bow to the Pope. Normally, if you're going into an order, you take it a bow of poverty, means you're not going to get rich. <coughs> Chastity, no sex, basically of any kind. And obedience, obedience to your leader. Well, they take a fourth vow of special obedience to the Pope. If the Pope tells them to do something, they do it. And therefore, that's caused a lot of friction over the years. And uh, they're, they've been at odds with the Vatican more than once. So the Jesuits are controversial, they always have been, and they got kicked out of about two dozen countries, maybe more, uh, because of their fanaticism, you might say. But they were very important to the Catholic Church. The Jesuits single-handedly won back the country of Poland. Poland had become Protestant. 
and the Jesuits got in there, started educating the elite, and that educational elite was eventually paid off in Poland moving back over into the Catholic sphere. So the, 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 the Jesuits have their detractors and they have their fans. They're, they're also great missionaries as well as, as educators. And so this is why it's very important to remember uh, that the Society of Jesus is a leader. Some of the great Baroque artists were Jesuits. <clears throat> By the way, did you know the present Pope, Francis, is a Jesuit? First ever Jesuit Pope. That just gives you some idea of how controversial the Jesuits have been. So the Jesuits came in in the 15. Uh, 40s, 50s, and so forth, they were approved by the Council of Trent. And there's never been a pope, of, uh, for, for example, uh, Franciscans and Dominicans, Dominicans especially have had something like 28 popes. In other words, popes tend to come from orders, right? But the Jesuits have never been allowed to have pope until Francis I. So that's kind of a contemporary tie-in. Now, what I, want to, what I want to talk about is the, uh, another event, which is very, very important in this whole, this whole deal. And that is, I'm going to try to put this up here. The event is known as the English Civil War. Civil War. 1642 to 1649. The English Civil War is why you can step out, walk across the street here to that Baptist church, and walk in and you will see no art, you'll see no icons, you'll see no altar, anything that smacks at Roman Catholicism. They are iconic, they are iconic class to the max. Why? Because of the English Civil War. Why is that? I will explain to you. So the English Civil War was basically in England between a group that we know in this country as the oops, here I got I'm always forever dropping I need about three of these to get through us. So, um, uh, there are two groups called the Puritans and the, and the Anglicans. Anglicans, the head of the Anglican Church to this day is, or the Church of England, is the king or the queen, right? So Charles is head of that church today. The Puritans, of course, are Congregationalists. So these Congregationalists means that the congregation has absolute sovereignty. Now what does sovereignty mean? absolute power. A Baptist church, an individual Baptist church, can pick its own minister, decide its own doctrine, decide it's going to do any number of things. But they will never uh, be in the church. They will never in the church emphasize the idea of icons, right? Icons are out in any way, shape, or form in Congregationalist Church. Well, there was a very famous Puritan Congregationalist by the name of Roger Williams. Now, Roger Williams, very important in American history. He had gone with the Puritans 
They were so persecuted by the Anglicans. We'll call these the royals. They were so persecuted by the Anglicans that they, the Puritans, a, a large group of them moved to Holland. Why Holland? Because Holland is Calvinist. And remember all of these groups, the Puritans, Congregationalists, are all Calvinists. And Calvin and Calvinism taught the glory of the supremacy of the individual church. It's called, we call it, representational government or even pure democracy. Because that church over there can, if it wants to, it probably won't, but on a majority vote of that congregation, they can decide they want to put a statue of Mary up in front, you know, right in the front. Now that's not going to happen because the majority would never do that because they're what? Iconoclasts in deep down in the bones, right? It's not that they're outside of the church, they might be artists, they might be sculptors, they may have works in museums, that's not the point. The point is historically, the church is not the place to do art. And so anyway, Roger Williams, uh, was over there in Holland, ran into the Anabaptists. Now the Anabaptists were very big in Holland. The Anabaptists, the most famous Anabaptists are the Amish, for example. The Amish, they have a doctrine which all of these people have, uh, all, excuse me, which all of the Baptists have called Believer Baptism. Now what's Believer Baptism? It's the idea you cannot be baptized until you're a believer. And you can't be a believer until you're old enough to make your own decision. If you can't make your decision, then you can't be a believer. Well, okay. So, baptism is not the act of, con of conversion or the act of, of commitment. Baptism is simply the symbol that it's taking place. That it's just a symbol that this is taking place for an individual. <coughs> Now this is mighty important because if you're if believer baptism is, is that it's up to the individual, right? Now, Roger Williams believed in that doctrine and embraced it, along with some others. Anyway, then they come back to England for a while, more persecution, they go over to the New World. It's called Plymouth Rock, right? Pilgrims are Puritans. And uh, then they start coming in great numbers 10 years later, 1630, to the Boston area, Massachusetts Bay Colony. But these are all people that are Puritans, but not necessarily Baptists. Well, Roger Williams gets kicked out of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, gets kicked out of Boston and in the middle of the winter, and he wanders around and he finds a tribe of Indians who take him in. And he's so appreciative of that, he calls the place where they took him in Providence. Because Providence is Calvinist code for the Word of God. In other words, we're always about Providence. We're always trying to get in harmony with the will of God. So this is an amazing moment in, in American history because then he starts a little settlement. Gradually people kind of come, come to him that also believe in believer baptism. And he establishes the America's first Baptist church in Providence, which eventually, of course, is named Rhode Island, smallest state in America. But if you look on the license plate of Rhode Island today, it'll say first in freedom. What that means is religious freedom. Religious freedom is what that's all about because 
not too long after he established Providence, Rhode Island, a group of Sephardic Jews from, from Brazil were trying to find a place to practice their religion. And Roger William welcomed them in. And there they, and there they established America's first synagogue. Amazing, right? So the, the, this Paul, term, uh, go ahead. The, uh, the chapel that's located out of Dallas Baptist yes. College is modeled after the first Baptist church in Providence, at least the exterior, not yes. the interior, the yes. exterior, yes. is modeled uh, after that uh, uh, present structure that's still there today. That is correct. And, and uh, that, of course, is a giant size, but, right. Uh, right. Yeah. but it's white, it's plain, it's unadorned. Right. Uh, you know, no Gothic architecture, no, nothing, yeah. just just very great simplicity. The spiral is the, the main. The spiral is the main event, and it's because they have a bell tower and they have Caroline's plane right. and you know so on. Now, what 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 the bat, what happens then is the American Baptists are really Calvinists. They believe deeply in the idea of the sovereignty of the individual congregation. So that's why it's called the Southern Baptist Convention. Convention of independent churches. Those independent churches can leave. They can be kicked out, actually. But again, by a vote of all the other churches. And so we have a church here in Dallas called Wilshire Baptist. Very progressive church. Uh, a wonderful church. A pastor named J George Mason. And they, they've been disaffiliated from the Southern Baptist Convention. So is Royal Lane Baptist Church. And Royal Lane. In North and, and others, yes. And so, anyway, seems like a far, long way from Baroque. <coughs> but this is, this is the essence, you have to understand, this is the essence of why Baroque took off. Not just in Catholic countries, but eventually in Northern European countries. And this is why my thesis is, that Baroque is not just a movement in this particular period of time, essentially from 1600 to the French Revolution. It is a movement. It is a, it is a movement that continues on. It has its own kind of force. I, I would call it a style. I would call it a style. So. We'll, we'll, we'll now leave the historical background of how, this is how to a certain extent, the Catholic Church, the Jesuits, Counter-Reformation, are promoting art, religious art. So we're going to be seeing some here momentarily. But let me first talk to you about the distinguishing characteristic of Baruch. All right, and these are quite amazing, and I want to, uh, I won't hit them all, but I do want to mention some. First of all, if you, if you, if you ask, your, ask the question, what does the word Baroque mean? You always get the same answer, that the word Baroque came from an irregular pearl, a pearl that is not perfectly shaped, it's kind of weird. But again, then there's other theories as to where the word came from. But the world, the kind of irregularity theme has some validity, as you will see. Uh, it, it's certainly not standard issue. Remember, they're coming out of the Renaissance, the classical period. All, almost all the, everything I'm going to show you is classical, but it has some, it, it goes beyond classical. And, and this is the thing that's, that's hard to get a hold of. So I'm going to just give you a few, um, a few, a few points. Oh, by the way, one more thing. That English Civil War, the Puritans won. The Puritans won, and it set up the Commonwealth. And so the idea that you could have religious freedom, not just in England but in the colonies eventually won the day. And so the Baptists 
could come and practice their religion freely. Very, very important because it applied to all the English colonies, the English speaking world. It became one of the few places in the world where you have real, true religious freedom. Another historically has always been India. In India, Hinduism is a conglomeration actually of many religious points of view. And they've kind of been unified into one. So uh, as early as three to four hundred years before the time of, uh, of Christ, you have groups going all the way to India. And the first group to go were the Jews. Jews persecuted, where could they find religious freedom? India. So this, the spice trade, the silk trade <coughs> in India, many of the leaders of that from the earliest days were uh, Sephardic Jews. Well, okay, let me, let me point, let me, I'm going to write down a few things here because th this is e extremely uh, important. So, first of all, uh, high drama. Very emotional. In fact, there's, a, there's a kind of a sense of a exaggeration. Um, heightened reality. Now, the, the heightened reality is something we're going to see. A heightened reality means here's, you, you eventually see things that aren't there. And uh, one of the things we're going to talk about is. Uh, This is a great French phrase. Trompe l'oeil. Trompe l'oeil. Trump. Or Trump. French means fool. Interesting. And right. L'oeil of the eye. In other words, the fooling of the eye. Mike knows a lot about this subject. But this is the fooling of the eye in art. And we're going to see it, and it's amazing. It's uh, hard to believe. It, there's a technical word for it. I'm going to give, you, give it to you here. Quad ra tura. Quad ra tura. This word means making something look three-dimensional on a one-dimensional surface. So you have a flat surface, and you look at it, it looks 3D. But long before, we had movies in 3D. Uh, there's a couple more I want to mention here. Hang on. Grandeur. Oh, by the way, another term for this uh, fooling of yacht is, is a forced perception, perspective. In other words, your eyes, your eyes forced to see things in a certain way. Okay, uh, I think that's enough for right now. Now, I want to, I'm going to start showing you slides. But this is always a um, tricky thing to do because we were set up here, but technically, you don't know, Mike's going to do the lights. Uh, I'm going to sit over here and talk to him over here, so be patient with us. We'll see if we can get this to work okay. <laughs> okay, because I've been, I've, I waited too long, I've got to maybe leave the lighter for just a minute. Okay, okay. all right. <laughs>
turn down the lights. All right, this is Caravaggio. Now, Caravaggio is one of the first and one of the greatest of the, of the uh, Baroque artists. Caravaggio is a, uh, a pioneer, you might say, in the things I do. Now, first of all, I want to tell you the story. This is the famous story of Judah uh, murdering Hophenaris. No, Hophenaris. Oh. Hole of fairness. Hole of fairness. Thank you. Hole of fairness. Thank you. So, Hole of fairness was a Syrian a general. Now, first to explain, the reason you probably have never heard this before is because the Catholic Bible, the Vulgate, translated by Saint Jerome, has books in it that are not in the standard Protestant Bible. The standard Protestant Bible starts, well, there are, there are a number of them, but the famous one is the King James Version. And there are books that they decided not to stick in the Protestant Bible. These are called apocryphal books. Now, I don't know why, because this is this story has to do with the period of the Babylonian exile. And <clears throat> Judith was, of course, um, a very gorgeous young lady who was uh, Jewish. And uh, she was, Honoferis Hona, Hona, Hona was sent by King Sennacherib to um, wipe out a whole community of Jewish people. So her idea was she would get, get into the palace, find him, seduce him, get him drunk, and then she, with the help of her maid here, would uh, cut off his head. And so this, this particular um, Caravaggio piece is then uh, done over and over and over again. Now, because of the screen, it is lightened up. It's not as rich. The color is much richer if you see what I'm looking at. And I'm looking at what's you know, close to the original. Now, this is Caravaggio. And, um, <coughs> It, he has a painting over in the Kimball that's very famous. Yes, the oh, one about the uh, card sharks. Card sharks, yeah. yeah. Now, Caravaggio was a, a really commercially a huge success, and he was very talented. Uh, Caravaggio was early, you know, in the, in the Baroque period, and uh, so we will um, now go to another one. We're going to see how this works here. Try to click. There's supposed to be an arrow over here. A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Right here. Can you see the arrow there? But thing that click on the arrow. Okay. So what I have to do is make this smaller. So that's what I'll do, so I can see it. Now you see it. There it is. There it keeps moving on me. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Okay. Now the other problem is it won't let me save these in the in the larger size so i have to you know, i'm gonna pull this one up all right now th this is a most important artist that's painting this one this is um her her name uh is gentileski 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 uh Armit our Armitesia Jemileski is a pioneer, is kind of a trailblazer for female artists in this period of time. There are very, very few. And she does this in even a more Baroque rendition, which is more colorful, more violent, 
notice the difference between how, she, how she's into it compared to the other Judith, who seems to be doing it very clinically, you know, like she's cutting a piece of meat. And this one is, you can see her arm is into it, and she's really doing her job. Uh, and the maid is helping her. By the way, her maid here is a young lady, and they're together, they're holding her down. In the other one, the maid was an elderly lady. And uh, so, let's see if I can just quickly go back and remind you, see this lady here on the far right? Elderly lady. Now, look at Judith here. She's almost like she's not even paying attention. She's just standing there, you know, very erect, just kind of sawing away. <laughs> and, 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 but, uh, uh, but, but so most Western Protestant folks don't know anything about this story, and they should. Uh, so it's done then by, by this famous Caravaggio, and then by this Chandelesky, and then by many, many others. Let's see if we can get this to go forward. Oh, I think I have to do this first. This is very picky. <laughs> okay, here's, just in case you want to know what this artist looks like, I brought in a, a photo of her. So, she's, she's um, a lot of self-portraits. This is Teleski painting herself. Amazing. Judith kind of looks, when she painted Judith, it kind of looks like her too. Oh yeah, hadn't thought about that. Excellent. Which makes it even better in a way, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah very good. All right, let's move on to another spectacular work of art. This is the famous Bernini, Bernini. and let's see if I can make it bigger. Okay, now th this is uh, the ecstasy of St. Teresa. And it, to see this in person is really something because it just, with all that gold, the gold rays coming down, which is kind of putting a blessing, a, a sanctification on her. And she is in a state of ecstasy. Uh, quite amazing. And here you have the angel who is, giving, who is uh, delivering um, the blow, you might say, or bringing the ecstasy. What, what's ironic here, of course, is the similarity between this and Cupid, right? This could be Cupid delivering an arrow of love. But in this case, the love is coming from God, and, and she is... Uh, she's the recipient. I want to show you a close-up of her, of her face this, in this sculpture. Um, by the way, before we leave that, how much chipping away do you have to do and work to, to create all of this effect of all this beautiful uh, fabric? I mean, you would, if you tried to stage this with actual cloth, you'd have an awfully hard time, right? But in stone, you can do what you want to do. And do you so, know how long it took to oh, complete? No, but I'm sure, I'm sure a long, long time. It was about <laughs> seven hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, what I don't know, is this one huge piece? In other words, is the angel over here, uh, I think he, the angel, I think it's all one piece, which makes it even more spectacular. But, you know, look at these, look at these fingers, how delicate they are, right? And then here's Bernardino you know, chipping away, and he goes, Ch oh, oops. And then he's got to start over, bring another block in, right? I mean, think about it, how, how fantastic that is. Uh, so let's look at this now. I'm going to pull this up as large as I can here. Thank you for your, your patience, please. Paul, oh, where is this uh, look at? This is in, um, this is in, in Rome. But the question is, uh, where, where, where is it? Uh, exactly, that's where it's at. I, I used to think it's in uh, St. Peter's, but I don't think yeah. so. I have to look that up. But look at her face, please. Is she in ecstasy? 
And uh, so you wonder what's going on in her brain. You know, is, is she hallucinating? Is she is she swooning? I mean, what's going on? And it's called the ecstasy of, of Saint, Saint, Saint Teresa. Teresa. Yeah, Saint Teresa was very uh, famous for her going into this kind of state where she could be in complete and other. Uh, Captivation by the Lord. Okay, now we're going to look at Bernini's, another of Bernini's famous works here. Now, here, I'm sorry, I gotta get rid of this. Anybody recognize this? This is, of course, uh, this is called, uh, I can't read my own reading, a Baldacino. This is a cover over the altar at St. Peter's. And all these little things down below are people sitting. Uh, the, the idea here is of the rope is that the columns are undulating. And, and because they're undulating, they're not um, ordinary. They're not regular. It's all about irregularity, right, in a way. And yet, but if you balanced all this, everything would balance perfectly. It's still symmetrical in that way. All right, let's see now. We're going to go now to um, a, a, a renaissance. I'm throwing in a renaissance because this guy started the whole business. Of, yeah, it, it's, a, it's pretty pixelated, but you have uh, a flat surface up there. <coughs> And in a in a church, and uh, here you have, or uh, actually I can't tell you where this is, but they have flat surface, and he then creates this illusion that you're looking. These people are looking down at you, including the, the cherubim, the so-called pudi. Now I'm going to get into pudi here in just a minute. So this this is a quadratura, right? This is quadratura, which again means you take a flat surface and you make it look the art three dimension. Quite extraordinary thing to do. And uh, so let's go down here. And now we're going into a, a, a pretty well known man by the name of Pazzo. Pazzo, P O Z Z O. And this. I'm going to pull up on it. This, this is so astonishing. You have to, you, you, you'd almost have to lie on your back to really see what's going on here. Uh, this, this is Apostle's famous Apotheosis of Saint Ignatius. So here, in case you didn't know who it was, the man here in, let's see if I can do right here, this is Ignatius kind of waving goodbye to the world. And this is heaven up here waiting for him. And all the angels and all the hosts are there. Let me do a close-up of, of this one. <coughs> and let's see if we can make make out something here. What does apotheosis mean? Yeah, I'll give it to you in just a second. Thank you. Oh, okay. I, I apparently uh, something came out. Mm. Let me go back there. Let me go back. It's doing all this stuff again. Okay. I want to, uh, I do want to write a pop field since up here might be and I would like to just a minute. Oh, sure. <coughs> St. Ignatius, of course, this is Ignatius Loyola. This is the man who founded the Jesuits. And this is a great tribute to him. So APO means, APO means like to go, right? Theo, God, Apotheosis. So 
literally what it means is to become a God. In this particular case, it means to go and be with God. But it's it's deifying him. It's de in other words, he's moving beyond sainthood up to some other higher category, right? Mm -hmm. But this is um, the most amazing in a way is the next slide I'll have to show you. Because this is Catholic. This is the height of the Baroque. <coughs> this is quadratura. This is a flat surface. Up. You know, but you can see the window is actually here. But from here up, it just, there's, there's, I think, two surfaces on which he did all this. But notice how <coughs> even below the window, it looks, the illusion is like there, these deities are, are there. And you have the Pudi. Okay, now let's talk about Pudi. <coughs> Pudi. Singular Pudo. These are cherubs. Now, I couldn't figure out for the life of me why cherubs always accompany Mary in these paintings. Why? Why cherubs? It made no sense to me whatsoever. And so, uh, uh, <clears throat> here's what here's what I wanted to uh, show you. I'll get to a slide that's going to explain, I think, better than I can say it, what I want to do. But right now, I want to show you the... Here it comes. I've got to get rid of this, and I've got to make this big. Does anybody recognize this? Do you know what you're looking at? Okay. If you were in Washington, D.C., in the capital of the United States, in the very center of the capital is the rotunda. If you lay down in the rotunda and lay down, this is what you'd see, and I'm going to show you a close-up of it now, because this is, guess what? This is a close-up of what you would see, and I'm going to get this as big as I can. Nope, too big, too big, too big. Right there. This is the apotheosis of George Washington. <laughs> In other words, there he is, <clears throat> with his hand up like a Caesar, his arm up like a Caesar, and he, all these gods and deities, this is obviously Athena, who has now become the American, you know, Lady Liberty, fighting for freedom, right? And this was done by a man named Bornini. Uh, no, 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 that's not right. Uh, this is done by an Italian artist who uh, I would have to look up. Um, but what I think is astonishing, overwhelming, is this idea that Washington is so revered, so considered so important, that in a secular, secular building, the capital of the United States, which is supposed to have no religious implications of any kind, here's Washington becoming a divinity. Talk about it, you know, talk about <coughs> over the top. If that isn't Baroque, I don't know what is. In other words, this Italian artist was just taking the, the apotheosis of St. Ignatius, only replacing it with George Washington. How unbelievable is that, right? All right, now let's see how we doing. We're okay on time for a minute here. All right, I want to show you an example of Baroque architecture. All right, Th this is a famous, um, uh, a man by the name of Boro Mini designed this. This is a San Carlo church, we would say in English, 
St. Charles's Church at the Four Fountains. Now, everything is symmetrical. I mean, everything is balanced in the classical way. But look at how strange it is, right? And then you have something up here in the very top in the middle. This is called a cartouche. Cartouche. Now, where did cartouche come from? Egypt. What do they use cartouches for? The cartouches were, they would have hieroglyphs, but then they would have a cartouche if they were going to encase the name of divinity, which could be the pharaoh or any of the royalty, because they were all considered gods, right? They were considered very, very important. So the point of this, whatever's written in there, and I don't, I don't know that anything's written, but you'll see cartouches in many buildings. I'm going to show you what the inside of this looks, and you'll see uh, the, the, the cartouche again. This kind of this oval design, right? And it has to say what it's saying essentially is this: this is holy. This is holy space, and if something is written inside it, which is often is this is holy script of, of a kind. Now. Have you ever seen a building like that? I mean, that's just unbelievable. Now, it's got niches in it with various saints and so forth, uh, but, but the overall design just knocks me out. Now, I'm going to take you inside this so you can see what we're talking about here. And this is the inside of that church, and I, I think I'll leave it right where it is. Right in the center is the cartouche. But look at the design of the whole thing around it. You know, it, it's, it's, I don't even know a word for that, that, that encases the entire sanctuary, right? It gets distorted over here, but you can see it pretty clearly on the bottom half here, how, how it's, you know, it's, it's undulating, right? There's always this idea of undulation, why it, it creates a sense of motion. Okay. Uh, that's so much for uh, Baroque architecture. Now I'm going to show you uh, this one. This is a um, famous painter by the name of Tintoretto, and this is his crucifixion. Now, the, the thing that kind of strikes me here is all stuff that's going on here, right? They just, the ladder is still up, I guess they're putting him up. They don't have the other two crosses up. Uh, and, uh, and yet, there's all this activity. There's just little stories all over here on what's going on. This is a very typical thing about Baroque. They're trying to create this sense that, it, that it's almost like it's, they're moving, right? They're in action, right? Now get ready for this one. This is the famous Last Supper by Tintoretto. Now you, I've studied this and studied this over and over, and what is amazing here is what's all stuff that's going on. Up, you can't see it very well, but up in the upper right-hand corner, you see the angelic host that are at the Last Supper, and then over on the other side, more angelic host. Jesus is dead center, but how different this is than Leonardo's Last Supper, right? So if you if you if you if you start counting here, let me see if I can take the pointer. You start counting here. One, you see the ones with the glow with the with the halos. One, two, three, four, five. And then six right here. Now this man right here is, is Judas Iscariot. He is no longer as a halo. Right? He's a bad guy now. Okay. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. It's all over there. Is it balanced? Well, yeah, actually. Everything on this, if you, if you use Jesus as a center, just draw a line down. Everything here is balanced with everything there. But look at all, the, look what's going on, and look at the angle. Whoever could imagine doing that 
from such an angle. Let's see if I have another shot at this. Now, this is better. I think I should have used this one in the first place. All right. It's not so much, well, in, in one way it is, because you see how the angels seem to really be kind of apparitions or phantoms, right? And come in, and uh, there are all these people doing, you know, all these things are happening. Somebody's down here washing something. I'm doing something with a tub, this lady at the bottom. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that's like. It's like laundry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So that's <coughs> Tintoretto. Right. Washing dishes. Yeah. Now, I'm going to show you uh, something here. Hang on, if you will. How are we doing on time? Just about two minutes left. I want to show you a if I can get this to work. I think I have to make this small again. It's not going to get small. All right, so let's see if I can go forward again. No? Okay, so let me get out of this. These two are both frozen in place, as is this one. Ah, oh, this one I can get. No, sorry. This one, I'm trying to get it to... So I can move to the, I need to move out of this. I'm going to do this. Hang on. Who painted that one? Bureaucrats. Yeah, that's right. The hard guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's so good. Yeah, it came out really good on your phone. New York's not in the days. Here, what I want to do, Robbie. You need respect of everything's. Yeah, yeah, so right here, see the hard to Okay, I want to do uh, right here. Right here. Okay. You see why my computer doesn't? Okay, what, let's Google it. What work are you looking for next? Well, it's right here. Or it's right? on Chase Store. Yeah. Or Arts. Okay, Arts. Okay, there we go. And uh, I want to do, hang on. Well, I'm sorry, folks, I'm going to have to find it because there's a slide that I need to show you that is, that is for whatever reason, I'm going to use this as my substitute right now. And then, okay. Oh, okay. Is that how? I know it's a different one, but yours is in here. Okay, can you, can you see this? Okay, you see all the hoodie here, Lord Cherubs, right? Yeah. Then you see Mary, she's in white and blue. <clears throat> now, the white and blue, the white represents virginity, the blue uh, is divinity. What's missing is the red. If you see the red, oh, and by the way, notice there's a crescent moon. Very, very important. There's a crescent moon just at her feet. You see, it? it's just a sliver of a moon. Just a sliver of a moon. And I'm going to show you one more, and, this, and then this is going to... This is one that Robin has down in the, the meadows. Yeah, but she's got the, yeah, she has the red. So yeah, <coughs> and notice that she has the red tied around her. The red implies mother. So in other words, she's just become pregnant. So this is, the, this, this is of course, the Immaculate Conception, both these paintings are called that, but in the other one, she hasn't perceived, conceived yet, not con yet conceived. So above her head is the, is the uh, angel, the uh, Buddha, which is the, the Holy Spirit, and down below you have the Pudi, and then here you have the, behind her is the moon. But in this case, the moon which doesn't show up hardly at all here on this one. I think if I make it real big, maybe you can see the moon. Can you make it? I never noticed the palm down. There's a palm, yeah. Is that yeah. The yeah, you see on the left here, just down below, you can see just a piece of the moon. Mike, if you turn it on, I want to make my point, and then you all <coughs> will call it quick. Okay. So I'm puzzled over this. 
Yeah, go ahead and turn on all the lights on. Okay. Yeah, okay. I've puzzled over this for years. Why the pooty? I mean, why cherubim? So there's a man that you've never heard of that is really important. Uh, where did I put my marker? Robin, is it right there? Thank you. There's a man that's really important in this story. He's somebody I want to introduce you to, and I'll pick it up here next time. His name is um, the uh, pseudo Dionysus. You have to get all this in because this is important. The Areopagite. Areopa. Areopagite. Areo, Mars, Hill. Mars Hill. This is the famous hill in, Af in Athens where the government of the Athenians met, where Paul came and preached. But more importantly, <coughs> this is the place where democracy, where the Republic, the Athenian Republic, which we model, was created. And it's also where the first jury was. <coughs> Athena created the first jury and for the cases of murder. And, it was, and so the Areopagite means he was a judge. Now nice is the Areopagite. He's a very, very famous judge. Well, some guy co-opted his name, so that's why I called Pseudo. He's the false. And what he wrote a famous um, track in which he gives the hierarchy of, of the angels. He, he reads the scripture and he decides there are these nine categories. The highest is the seraphim. The seraphim, this gives a plural. These are the seraphs that are closest to God. That's all they do is they're around God. The second category is the cherubim. And who are they next to? Mary. Yes. See, it's a way, it's a way of showing how high Mary is. By the way, if you go to the very last bottom of the all these categories, angel. So the angels that come mostly to earth are are called they, they're the angels, but they're, they're these are all considered messengers. So an angel is a, is a very low level in the divine order of things. Very, very low. And as a messenger, just runs around. But this is, <laughs> this is why they're cherub. To show that Mary is protected by, is being honored by, being glorified by these cherubs. Cherubim, right? Meaning she is of the second, she's, she's, she's up there with God. And I would say equal to Jesus, at least in terms of the art. So when you go down to the Meadows Museum, and you'll see this very painting here, uh, you'll see that this is Immaculate Conception. What are all the cherubs doing there? Again, they're there to make sure you understand the importance of Mary. Okay. Now, to be continued, we're going to get into French, English, German, I uh, broke, and then, and then what I'm going to do the last uh, Sunday is I'm going to show how the broke then influences all the other arts, and this is stunning, stunning, what happens that even in these Protestant countries, they they just grab and go with it, and here here is the cliffhanger. What is the greatest of all gifts of the broke? Of all the gifts of the broke, what is the greatest? Or, or put another way, what art form came from the broke? You'll be, if you haven't figured it out yet, you'll be surprised when you're here. So I hope you'll come back to find out. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.